Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's speaker series with Melly Hobson. Before we get started, I will hand it over to Jerry Rosari for some opening remarks. Jerry, over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this installment of our speaker series featuring Melody Hobson, the co-CEO and president of Ariel Investments. I will say that Melody is the very definition of involved. Uh, she currently serves as vice chair of the board of Starbucks and is also a director at J.P. Morgan Chase. She is chairman of the After School uh, Matters, which is a Chicago-based nonprofit that provides teens with high-quality after-school and summer programs. She is vice chair of World Business Chicago, co-chair of the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art, a board member of the George Lucas Education Foundation, and a board member of Bloomberg Philanthropies. Thank you so much. We're so happy to have Melody here with us tonight on such a phenomenal, coming off of such a great weekend where we have our vice president-elect who is the first woman and the first black woman to be in that position and joined by Melody who is an exceptional woman in and of herself. Uh, Jerry gave us a, a brief background. You're on the board of J.P. Morgan Starbucks. You have to have a resident college named after you at Princeton. And we are here to talk about intersectionality, which is looking at race, gender, class, and how all of those overlap to just talk about our unique experiences. And so we want to hear from you. How does all of what you do and what you present make up who you are and how you manage and how you lead? Wow, that's a big question. I think that um, we, are, we are an amalgamation of a whole lifetime. And certainly that's true of me. The early version of me, of the little kid who was the youngest of six kids in my family from a single mom who struggled uh, at times, not as much as some, but a lot, it felt like to me, um, really, I think, gave me a great deal of resilience I think a lot of people look back at those early years of their life, especially if they were tough and feel some kind of sadness or disappointment. I just, I just feel that it, it helped build a stronger version of Melody and ultimately allowed me to forge ahead and have the will to um, persist in accomplishing some of the goals that I set for myself. And the goals weren't around titles or money. The goals were around excellence. I thought if I was excellent at things, it would bring new opportunities to me. And to the extent that I could be prepared, it would augment my confidence in situations. Wonderful. So Melody, just to follow up on Natalie's question, um, given the fact that we have an opportunity to have um, a new administration in place and a person of color and a woman in her seat. Um, wanted to get your thoughts about how do you believe that um, that will help advance the diversity dialogue? And then if you could comment, what are some of your own uh, perhaps hopes and aspirations for a, the Biden-Harris administration? So first I'll start by saying, yay, I'm so excited. <laughs> for Kamala and for us. And I posted a picture that was the picture of, uh, it was a picture of Kamala standing next to the shadow of um, the little black girl who was crossing the, the um, segregating schools. And uh, it's such an iconic photo. And they were standing next to each other. And I said, that little girl is all of us. And so how does it change things first and foremost? I think it lets a lot of black and brown girls know that there are no limits to the possibilities for them in the highest offices of our land. And that is truly heartening. I was teary over that moment, over that thought. But it also, I think, helps to change the mental models that people have, where they have this idea of what a vice president is supposed to look like and what they're supposed to be. Every, it gets adjusted. And that in, in that adjustment, it gets more inclusive. And I think that's a really, really great thing. What are my hopes? First and foremost, my hopes for the Biden-Harris administration is that they'll, they'll be successful because that's so important to all of us, no matter who you are, no matter what party you belong to. We want our president and vice president to be successful because that means that the possibility of America being more successful and us as individuals being more successful increases. Secondly, I'd say my host for them is that we have some calm 
I think it'll be really great to be in a situation where the headlines don't overtake us on a day-to-day -day basis, which I know makes investing challenging with the volatility it often creates in the markets. We don't need any self-induced, um, I think volatility, self-induced anxiety. And I think we've had some of that. And it'll be nice just to be in calmer seas. And I say that without making a value judgment. I just think that America is, especially with COVID and everything else, there is just a real need for some calm. There's just been a lot of drama. And so those are obviously, you know, those sound like very big picture and mom and apple pie. Um, there are a lot of other things I'd like to see an immigration policy. Uh, I'd like to see the DACA kids have a path to citizenship. I'd like to see, um, I think they have a lot of work ahead of them in terms of uh, turning around the financial situation of the country. But we've been to this movie before. And we, I believe in American ingenuity and American know-how will get out of this uh, crisis that we're in. The market, of course, today seems to suggest that they agree a post-vaccine economy will allow us to return to some kind of uh, normalcy and ultimately, hopefully, financial strength. Great. I want to say amen. Yeah. <laughs> that works. Um, yeah. And so, Melody, you've talked about challenges and the challenges that we see in our society, but even for yourself, I'm sure there were, we've heard about your successes. I'm sure those were have their challenges or maybe opportunities for change um, in your life. And wanted to talk to you about what was it like to be the only one in a room at different stages of your career and what that meant to you and how you, you went through that. So both of you, Michal and Natalie, you know what it's like. You've been the only one too. So the question is, what do we want to project? And I said, my confidence was always augmented if I was prepared and studied. And so I always think that's a good idea. But being the only one became to, for me a, um, a very interesting um, opportunity. So I don't believe in first and only, and I want to say that. I think people who brag about being first or only, I think that we should all be going for first of many. So that's one thing I should say, that, that does not give me any kind of pride. However, when I have been in the only one in the room, one of the things that I've done is to realize my uniqueness would allow me to stand out. I remember going to lots of conferences, especially early in my career, and people would come up to me and say, Melody. And I'm like, how do they know my name? And then it became very, very clear to me, I was the only one. So I started to make jokes. I'm like, listen, I can use this to stand out. I could literally be a one name person like Cher or Beyonce. I don't even need a last name because of how different I am in this room. It's a different mentality and sort of lamenting. I said, okay, if I'm gonna be memorable, I'm going to be memorable. I'm gonna have memorable things to say. I'm gonna have memorable thoughts and I'm going to leave an impression that hopefully makes it easier for the next melody that comes along. That's fantastic. Moving toward the financial services industries, historically had been underrepresented by minority groups, whether it be gender, race, um, across uh, the broader population, but probably more pronounced at kind of the the upper echelon, uh, the top tier. So what do you think um, has contributed to your success? I know you talked before about hard work, but also kind of as you rose through the ranks. And what does that maybe reflect on Ariel as, uh, you know, clearly one of the top uh, African-American investment firms, but also happens to be employee-owned. Like, what is it about Ariel that I think allowed you to achieve that success? So both the combination of the you and, and the company. So I'm just writing notes because there's so much there. First, it's interesting. I just will challenge this idea. Women are not a minority in the United States, but we're a minority in the financial services industry and in lots of industries. It's just sort of an interesting thing which has happened in terms of how the, the world gets reset around our lack of representation. Um, the second thing I would say is that when I think about um, how, how and why I was able su to succeed, my mother, um, who you know, was just so unusual in so many ways, an introvert, really quiet, but she always used to tell me, make yourself indispensable. Make it so they can't let you go. They can't fire you. 
I know that's an interesting way of thinking about a career, but that's what always led me. I was like, I want to be the person someone wants on their team, that they want to grab you because you do such excellent work mm -hmm. and they seek you out. So the way that I did that, I just volunteered for all the work no one wanted to do. I mean, literally no one. <laughs> and I would do anything, no matter what the ask was, I just tried to be enthusiastic about it. And sometimes not being in love with the work, but saying it's what you project to people that will give me the next opportunity. And I remember I told this story, John Rogers, who founded our firm, he came in one day and he's like, Melody, you write the best thank you notes. My daughter, Victoria, had a sleepover last week. Do you think you could write a thank you note to the parents? And you know, some people may have been offended by that. And so I said, can I talk to Victoria? She was a small child. He's like, why do you need to talk to her? I was like, I need to know about the party. And you know, and I literally sort of like asked her, she's on the phone, she's like seven, how was the cake? What games did you play? So John is looking at me and I was like, listen, these parents are gonna say, this is the best birthday party thank you note I've ever gotten. And that would happen in all sorts of ways. The client letters that we wrote, we used to write a column for Forbes. We used to, I mean, we were asked by the Wall Street Journal once to do a book review. And I was like, I just want it to be the best thing they ever saw. So I would kill myself. I mean, just like so much self-flagellation and so much worry, but I really wanted to make sure that anything that we did um, was great. And I was just willing to volunteer for those things. I've got one of those coming up because the Wall Street Journal asked us to do a column for year end where they're going to a lot of experts and ours is on the, the markets. And I'm, I, it's due on Friday. And of course I'm like cursing myself, like, what was I thinking? Why did I say yes? But at the same time, I want you all to read it and say like, wow, they did a really good job. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a funny balance and conversation I have in my head. Yeah, that, that's amazing and fantastic. And then we can sense the enthusiasm now as you're speaking. And you have brought that enthusiasm to the living room of many Americans when you were doing your various TV spots. And we spoke a lot about financial literacy and I know that's very important to you. So I wanted to talk to you a bit about and wanted you to tell us what trends you're seeing in the communities of color, in particular for women of color, as it relates to financial literacy and, and the importance that that holds for you and, and for each and individual Americans as we, we move forward. This is a big one because if we had had a financially literate society, I don't think we would have had the great recession. Uh, people wouldn't have been signing up for mortgages that they couldn't afford. Banks wouldn't be trying to do that. I mean, there was a whole, I'm not placing blame. I'm just saying no one ever taught us. It's especially true of people of color. It's more true of women than not. And I, I challenge everyone all the time. I see it boggles the mind that in high school in America today, you can take wood shop or auto and not a class in investing, which always leads me to ask audiences who whittles in their spare time, who cleans their own carburetor, no one. And yet no one takes you as you about the Dow, the NASDAQ, the S&P. I'm not talking about home ec or how to read a light bill and write a check. I'm talking how to really understand the financial market so that when you're sitting there picking investment options for your 401k plan, which has not only implications for you and your, your own financial security later in life, but perhaps the wealth that you might leave behind to your heirs, that you get it right, but no one taught us. And so that makes this a mission for me. I'm like an evangelist on this topic, but as I think to the extent that we have financial literacy in society, will actually narrow the wealth gap that exists, both with black and brown people and the majority community, as well as the wealth gap that exists in terms of gender. So that's actually a great segue to one of the questions we had uh, related to the wealth gap, and that's the gender pay gap. And it exists not just for women, but even more accentuated for women of color. And I believe it takes an additional eight months for women to make up that gap. What advice would you give to managers or companies as a whole in terms of trying to bridge and address this disparity, whether it be um, in, in, in promotion, uh, promotions, advancement, as well as compensation? First and foremost, you've got to keep track of the numbers. I keep saying, if it matters, it counts, so start counting. 
You have to see across all categories, where are your people? Are they rising up? Are they not rising up? And understand why. I'm a big believer and big fan of um, gender equity pay studies. I think those are a good idea. And I recognize they're not one and done because you have to do them on a regular basis just to account for all the movement in a population of employees, as well as a whole host of issues from um, women stepping out of the workforce for um, to have a baby to a whole host of things. And that should not penalize us the way it has historically. As they say, a college educated woman, they call it the mommy tax, uh, foregoes about $1 million in salaries and promotions and advancement over the course of her professional lifetime for every child that she has. That's not right. So I think also in America is really starting to understand the exposure that exists around this issue to the extent that that equity is not there. And I think that's a wake up call. The lawsuits were a wake up call. And I'm not a fan of, of lawsuits, but I do think that people are more intentional about this now. And I think that the thing is the whole society is smartened up. As corporate America, like there's nowhere to hide. The accountability factor is so much higher than ever before because of the viral nature of our society. So I'm hopeful. I know there's still a long road to go here. So please don't think I'm being Pollyannish about this, but I think at least the keeping track leads to a better outcome. Right. And that's actually a great point that you've made, Melody. One of the things you say is that change doesn't come from without, it comes from within. And that institutions sort of need to fix themselves, right? When they're going about this. So wanted to hear from you around this topic. I know you talk about the gender gap study, pay equity study. What are some other advice or takeaways that you can help provide us in terms of how firms can fix themselves and, and how they can do the measurements and, and try to further themselves along this journey called diversity, equity, and inclusion. Well, at Ariel, we're co-sponsors of something called the Black Directors Conference. And it brings together the Fortune 500 Black Directors. And also in recent years, we've added Latinx Directors. And the whole idea of us coming together is to think and make sure that the civil rights agenda is not left out of the boardroom. And we think that is part and parcel to our fiduciary re responsibility because to the extent companies are not inclusive and diverse, we think there's a lot of embedded risk there. So we bring together all the Fortune 500 directors and we talk about the three Ps, people, purchasing, and philanthropy. That's our call to action. And we wanna measure across categories. So with people, we say from the top of the organization, the board, all the way down, by ethnicity and gender, what do your numbers look like? No putting everyone together in one big multicultural umbrella because it masks the underrepresentation. You don't get credit for that. And no patting yourself on the back if 90% of your women employees are assistants. That doesn't work. So we start off with people and we think to the extent you're tracking and have the numbers, again, it leads to better outcomes, especially in terms of Long, establishing long-term targets. I didn't say quotas, I said targets, which is very different. Targets are goals, quotas are mandatory. And in corporate America, we're used to targets. We have earnings targets, we have profitability targets, we have all sorts of targets that we're very used to. The second thing we talk about is business diversity, making sure that your spend, your corporate spend, also considers minority vendors. And this is something that heretofore people haven't spent a lot of time on, or they talk about what we call last century supplier diversity, where they don't focus on the big areas of corporate spend, which is professional services, which are professional services, financial services, and technology. So making sure there's representation there. And then last but not least, philanthropy. To me, it's become the tail that's wagging the dog. I think there's a lot of virtue signaling going on right now where corporations want credit for their donations. I'm happy that they're making them to civil rights institutions, but they cannot, as you've already suggested, fix their house from without. They must fix it from within. So I know we're running uh, tight on time. I want to hit on a couple of things. So um, I loved listening to your TED talk where you talk about being 
uh, Color Brave. So for those who haven't watched it, I highly recommend it. Can you explain what that means? And then just given the current environment that we are all in, like, what does that mean in our current context? Because I think the TED Talk was a couple of years back. I did it in 2014. It's hard to believe that was six years ago, but it's perhaps even more relevant than ever before. I mean, this is the same story over and over and over again. I love this joke. Someone once told me that when Einstein was at Princeton, he was giving a task to the students and one of the students raised their hand and they said, Professor Einstein, Professor Einstein, the questions on this task are the same as the questions last year. And he said, the questions are always the same. It's the answers that are different. And when I talked about being color braid, I was really trying to address this idea that so many people had proudly told me about, which is that they were colorblind. They were often members of the majority community. I don't say that to be disparaging, but there was pride. I don't see color. And I started to finally realize and say, you don't see color, but everyone around you is like you. So maybe we need to step out of that not seeing color and see it. Because if you see it, you would see it's missing. So instead of being colorblind, how about we become color brave? We invite people in our world who don't look like us, who don't think like us, who don't act like us, and who don't come from where we come from. And let's see how that actually enhances our life and I believe ultimately builds a more tolerant society. Thank you, Melody. That, that was wonderful. And, and just to stay on that for a bit when we talk about being so brave and all the things you say is to be unapologetically a woman and unapologetically Black. And wanting to get your views on how do you do that in a professional setting such as corporate America, which at times may not have that as the standard. And there may be struggles of how you present. And for example, we have the Crown Act, which was just passed last year, which it actually had to be enacted that you could not hire a woman, a woman of color, a black woman for wearing her natural hair to the workplace. Um, so how do you become color brave and be unapologetically black and a woman and love your jacket as being unapologetically a woman? Um, how do we do that um, when the standards may be different? I don't think it's about standards. I think it's about you and what you decide you want to be and what image you want to project. And for me, the story that this uh, whole idea of being unapologetic came to me at a funeral. And it was the funeral of John Johnson, the great American entrepreneur who started Ebony and Jet magazines. And he had all these eulogies and one was more special than the next. And it was people like Bill Clinton and all sorts of people sending him off. And it was Tom Joyner, the very famous black disc jockey, who said that John Johnson was unapologetically black. And I remember sitting there and I was just taken aback by the concept. And I decided at that moment, that is what I wanted to be in everything that I did, that I did not want to apologize for who I was. And I could think of little ways in which I had done it. And I said it would never happen again. And I felt the same thing about being a woman. That doesn't mean I have to be militant. It doesn't mean I have to, you know, be in people's face with my, with, you know, some kind of very heavy handed black agenda or, or feminist agenda. But it does mean that I can be authentic to myself, believe what I believe, not leave those things out the door when I walk into a room. And I think that to the extent that more of us become more and more comfortable with that, we will be more successful. I've been able to be in rooms by being just this, not by changing or you know becoming something else. And I think that that ultimately is what leads to success. I remember once reading Warren Buffett talk about the fact that it's really hard to be original. It's super hard. And to be original means that you don't remind anyone of anyone they've ever met. So think about the Beatles or Michael Jackson or Elvis Presley. Think about Stevie Wonder. Think about, you know, there are so many people who fit that mold. They just don't, they're, they're completely something of their own. And when you think about that, that's what I decided I wanted to be. My own original self and my own original self was deeply rooted in my gender and my race. Because I think that's what people see first when they see me. And so I accept that. 
And then I say, I'm going to leverage that and fully embrace what they see because it is who I am. Well, you have such a positive mindset and, and a view uh, toward the world and trying to change it. How have you kept kind of that sanity during the pandemic, during the social unrest that has engulfed our country uh, over the past, um, gosh, I, I lost count since every day kind of blends into the next. So this is what I would say. I'm a human being. I have bad moments like anyone else. I think what I do is I have great lifelines of people that I can call and be absolutely vulnerable and real with and say, I hopefully I try to show up that way all the time, but like this really happened. This was a setback. This was a really bad day. I was treated very badly by this person. They were super condescending. Uh, what I channel in those moments is that they're being that way to me. Think of how they treat someone they see as less significant. And that really, really upsets me. And so then what I do is I get resolved and my resolve becomes one of being better and, and winning. And it'll manifest itself in all sorts of ways. I had a bad week last week actually with someone who I didn't think was kind, fair, appropriate. Um, and it set me back. It set me back on my heels for a minute. And the next morning I got up and I was running on the treadmill. I was running so hard so hard because I just was in my mind saying I will not be pulled back and taken down by this 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 spirit or this attitude or this way of thinking or what this person is projecting on me. And all I could do is run. I couldn't change his mind. I couldn't make him a better person. I couldn't resolve myself that somehow he was going to be better than the next version of Melody. But I could just get stronger in the moment in terms of what I was going to do to prove him wrong. That's, I, I don't know how else to think about these things. And I had a couple people talk me through it that I called on the phone, John Rogers with one. So it's nice to have a moment to commit it, right? Commiserate, but no long standing pity parties. You know, you can't do that. So I got back up because that's what we do. I was listening to that letter that Joe Biden wrote to himself. It was on CBS this morning. And he said, his mother always said to him, when you get knocked down, get back up. I got a little choked up. Because I was like, that is what we do as women, as people of color. That is the history of hundreds of years of our ancestors. That is what we do. So the words that were said to me last week are nothing compared to the suffering that my community and my gender has had. Amazing. Well, I know that we are coming close to the end. So quickly, let's just wrap up. Like, what, what are your thoughts and hope for the future of the world. I know we talked about the next four years, but where do you see this all? Where do you see women, people of color, all the intersectionality that goes on in advancement and just us coming together as, um, as Americans and as individuals in particular in corporate America? So my vision is one day we won't even have panels like this, that people won't even know what you're talking about. That why, is, why do you even need a conversation like this? and um, that society will be a truly open and fair place. Now, these are obviously not um, realistic goals for the short term, but over a lifetime, you know, maybe, you know, as Barack Obama or who I don't know who has said it, the arc of ben history bends and sometimes it drifts back, but the, the course of history has been in the right direction. It just hasn't always been as fast as we all wanted it. So we must be pleased with Kamala being vice president, or I should say vice president-elect. It should not sound that familiar, um, but never satisfied. And if we live in the never satisfied space, we will make progress. That's amazing. Mel Melody, thank you so much for your time, for your inspiration, and um, hope to have you back in the not too distant future and hopefully live next time. But thanks for having me. Really, really no appreciate problem. being here. Good luck. Thank, Thank you so much. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye.